Welcome to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust, a podcast for digital transformation leaders where we discuss the latest cyber attack issues, enterprise security strategies, and current security events so that you can successfully accelerate network and security transformation. And now here's what's on our mind this week. Welcome everybody back to another episode of Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. I'm so glad you joined us today. I'm really excited about this topic today because it's near and dear to my heart and my former role. And with me, special guest is Harshaw Nagaraju, Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Zscaler. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Pam. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So this topic, everyone, is Zscaler is the first to bring to the industry a cloud resilient capability. Now, this isn't, and, and Harshaw, we need to, you know, we'll, we'll jump into all this, but yeah. this isn't about the resilience of the Zscaler cloud. This is about all of you being able to bring resilience into your actual organizations to have some sort of independence from the Zscaler cloud. And, and hopefully I've kind of framed that up for everybody. 100%. I think that's the way to look at it. The way we think about resilience is how can our customers continue doing business irrespective of what happens? We call it the black swan event, right? Which is the worst case scenario. Let's say the internet is down. Let's say, God forbid, something happened, there is a flooding somewhere and Zscaler for some reason goes down. Doesn't happen quite often, but it's happened once or twice in the past, right? So we kind of take it upon ourselves. It's our responsibility to ensure that our customers are uh, never kind of held back in their business. They, their business should continue irrespective of what happens to all of their vendors, not only Zscalers, but Zscaler wants to take this upon ourselves. It's our responsibility. We want to make sure customers uh, stay protected in every scenario. That's how we think about resilience, right? And it's also, um, it's, it's, it's three, think of it as concentric circles. One thing is, what do we do first to ensure that the Zscaler cloud doesn't go down at all? How do we ensure that you always have that optimal performance? We do that um, inherently. We have been doing that ever since the cloud has has been out. So this is not new. The second thing is how we kind of continue keeping it that way. One is building it with the right architecture. Second thing is with the cloud lifecycle management. How do we ensure that software is developed uh, correctly? How do we ensure that bugs are not there? And the third thing, which is what is the focus of the the big announcement that we did is giving customers the tools, like you pointed Mm -hmm. out, Pam, to, to ensure that they can continue working if something goes wrong, even with Zscaler Cloud. Um, mm-hmm. We don't anticipate that ever happening, but it can happen. And in that situations, there are things that we can do to help customers and there are things that customers should do on their own. And we want to give them those best practices so, so they are always protected. So that's kind of how we look about resilience. That is really um, game changing. Because, you know, in my former role, when we actually thought about moving to Zscaler, we thought, Phew, yeah. And I'll never forget the CIO at the time asking me, well, Pam, aren't we putting all our eggs in one basket with Zscaler, <laughs> yes. right? And what's what's our disaster recovery? And, uh-huh. I, and I said, well, we really don't have any disaster recovery with our VPN today, uh-huh. right? Yeah. If a concentrator goes down, well, you shut that one down, and but now you have to read map everyone 100%. to the other concentrators, mm-hmm. right? Or some people have failovers with, with some of the concentrators, yeah. but if you lost that environment, you were down. And so it's exciting to see that Zscaler has this capability. Can you talk a little bit more, yeah. though, you, you've talked about the black swan and the black swan is, you know, mm-hmm. Zscaler is down. Yeah. But there's also situations that m- many will encounter mm-hmm. where we are not quite down or but yeah. the service isn't working. Can you talk about some of the other scenarios? Yeah. Like a yeah. brownout or so forth. Exactly. Exactly. I think anybody who's interested in uh, in disaster recovery, or just uh, looking at their own business continuity planning, as it's called BCP for short, uh, which is right now a board level conversation. Most organizations are thinking about, hey, what is our business continuity plan? Because anything can happen. So anybody who's interested in that should think about categorizing all of these events to various buckets. There are what's called as blackouts, right? Blackouts is when, let's say, a data center goes down. It, there is a power cut somewhere, and then you completely lose access to an entire data center through which some maybe critical services we're going through. Those, I think, although it seems they are, it, it can be disastrous, I think they're easier to detect and respond to because you know that you have zero access to something. And then, like you said, we read out the traffic to some someplace else. We'll have a few minutes or hours of loss of connectivity, and then we'll be back on, right? So that's what we call as the blackout scenarios. And then we already do a lot of things there uh, as Zscaler. The second thing is brownouts. Brownouts mm-hmm. is, 
is what I would call as a slow killer in the sense that, you know, think of the situations where productivity is slowly dropping because your network is just slow because Mm -hmm. the uh, traffic is taking this very convoluted path. And over time, people just get used to this low performance. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, the entire organization is operating at a lower performance. And so this is what I call as a slow burn. And we call this a brownout situation where overall the entire productivity of the company has come down and nobody really caught it because they just get used to this, right? And that can happen when you don't have the right traffic routing and then the things that uh, there's a lot of head pinning happening and things like that. And then the third one is what we already touched on, the, the catastrophic events, the black mm-hmm. spot events when everything is down, right? But I think it's good for us to categorize it in this way and then think about how do I address each one of these. So how does it actually work? And, and if I understand correctly, there's two forms of it, yeah. right? For one form is getting users to internet destinations and the other is to private applications. Can you talk a little bit? how it actually works for each of those platforms? Yeah, 100%. So let's, uh, what you're talking about right now is uh, if the Z-Scala cloud is down, for example, how do we address this, right? Um, most organizations, they have a mix of applications. Some of them uh, requires you to go over the internet, a- access some SaaS applications, let's say. Some others are private applications, mm-hmm. which probably sitting behind the data center someplace because they're proprietary applications, you wanna keep them close. So what we do is when this happens, our recommendation is when you to access the um, internet applications, you can do one of two things. One, you can fail open, meaning all your security controls are now gone temporarily and you give access to the open internet to, for, your, for your customers, mm, for your okay. employees, so they can continue working while we bring the cloud back up, right? Although we don't recommend that, that's an option. What mm-hmm. we recommend is uh, always prepare yourself for the scenario mm-hmm. and make a list of those applications that are critical for you that your employees should have access or a customer should have access even in a situation like this, right? It does not have to be the open internet, meaning create your list of uh, allowed sites and block sites. Okay, so basically I would say, hey, here's my list. I'm going to allow Salesforce, Workday, Office 365. Only. Yeah. And I can only get to those things. I can't get to anything else. Exactly, exactly. Because that's where the bad stuff comes in. So if you know that something is a known good site, mm-hmm. you put that in your, hey, this is my uh, good list or my mm-hmm. allowed list. And then even when the cloud goes down, you give them access to that. Not that you're losing all control or security controls. You can still apply some of it, but you don't have the full capability of a Z-Scaler cloud, for example, when the cloud is down. So when it comes to private applications, I think it's we have a very unique and a nuanced solution here. What we do is, we, instead of uh, routing all the traffic through the cloud uh, mm-hmm. central location, we will uh, route it through what we call as a private service edge. And that is hosted on your the customer's data center. It could also be hosted in a public cloud. Mm-hmm. What we do is that when the main Zscaler cloud is down, we traf- we, uh, we instead route all the traffic through the private service edge, and you still get access to those applications. The private service edge, think of that as a replica of the, the entire cloud. So it, all, it mm-hmm. almost has the same exact security policies that the cloud has but now it is working almost offline. So you've made a copy of those security policies, it's sitting in your data centers and the traffic goes through those while the main cloud comes up, right? Um, The catch there again is we don't want you to consider this to be normal operating procedures. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't want to say, hey, if this works, by the way, we need the cloud. We can always use the private service edge, right? The lim- there are limitations there well, because you it, it, it is uh, you'll have to size up your private service edge and then the more applications you pass through this there's more private edge, service edges you need and then you're creating a little bit of a you're adding costs so even here our recommendation is identify mm-hmm. what those critical applications are and give access only to those using the private service edges so that's that's ingenious because you know right now i was sitting at first i was sitting listening to you and i, I was starting to cringe because i was like i don't know how i don't, may not have enough bandwidth yeah. right at yeah. my facility at my data center yeah. let's say mm-hmm. um but what you're saying is that which is ingenious you spin up a cloud instance of the private service edge yeah. whether whatever cloud it is of your choice yeah. you have this sitting there and based on the cloud effect you can expand mm-hmm. or contrast exactly. based on your need designate your private applications. Now the p- private applications are either going to be back in your data center yep. or in various clouds exactly. in the world, right? Exactly. And you can get to them. Do you have? Do you recommend having various private service edges or is there more of a central private service edge that will work as your BCP plan yeah. and that you'll funnel irrelevant of where you are in the world, you'll funnel through that and then connect to that private app? 
Yeah, either or. I don't think there is a, a, a one way, one good way to do this. If you think that, hey, I have lots of application in a certain part of the world, I want a private service edge only for that. I think that's that's yeah, that's a good solution. But if you think, uh, hey, I I'm fine if there is only one. I don't want to pay for the extra costs, mm-hmm. and my applications are more or less located in one part of the world. Then one service edge, private service edge, is enough for you, right? Right. Um, and I, I think it, there's no real, uh, I, it's about you have to look at where your applications are and then decide. And where your user base is. Because I'm thinking some of the multi multinationals, they may have regional based applications, yeah. right? To your point, it may make sense to spin up a private service edge in a region of the world for yeah. users to connect to. And when that happens, is there anything a user has to do? I'm glad you asked because I think that's where I think the secret sauce is. And we're mm-hmm. doing something so unique. Um, and uh, and easy. Uh, what happens is um, the DNS system is is probably still on, almost always on, mm-hmm. even if if the cloud goes down. So what we made this so simple. When the cloud goes down, our um, the digital experience monitoring tool will tell you, hey, there is an issue in this region. Um, apps are taking longer to load. People are not getting okay. access. As soon as that happens, you know that there is a problem. All you have to do is go to your DNS system and just update a text record to say, I want to be in DR mode. And that's about it. Okay. It'll automatically switch away from uh, uh, the, the cloud. The Zscaler the, cloud. Zscaler cloud, it'll take you to the private service edge and then everybody's working normally, right? And that's the, 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 the genius of this in terms of making it so easy. And then when the cloud is back up, all you have to do is again, update the text record mm-hmm. and then everything goes back to normal operating mode, traffic goes through the exchange and things are back to normal. So it's, it's that simple. So some users may be out there listening saying, okay, I did not, in our company didn't invest in the digital experience monitoring, yeah. mm-hmm. right? That is not a requirement. Mm-hmm. The nice thing is with the digital exchange monitoring, it'll actually alert it will you alert. to say, hey, there's a problem. Yeah. Assess the problem. You may need, to, and, and at that point, right? Let's yeah. the technical staff's looking at the Zscaler website. They're seeing we may have an outage. Exactly. They're going to react. Exactly. That's the other thing. Um, yes, I did kind of make, make a plug for one of our good products. <laughs> it's a great product, though, because it is very proactive. It is. That's right? the idea. We don't want to be reactive. We want to get ahead of the problem. And right. that's why our digital experience monitoring tool was even built from, from the ground up. But we have always had what we call as a trust portal. Mm-hmm. So Trust Portal is our web page where it'll tell you the performance of each of our Zscaler clouds at every point of time. And if there is an outage or any issue someplace, mm-hmm. the first place it'll get notified is on our Trust Portal. And you can always go to trust.zscaler.com and you'll get the latest data on, on what is happening. And you will get notified too if you are one of the affected customers. So mm-hmm. if that could be a way for you to understand, to know that there's a problem and then go update your text record too. So that's the other way if you don't have the experience. So, Krasha, you touched on a point earlier. I want to come back to the BCP yeah. for business continuity planning. So many organizations have to go through their annual whether it's twice a year, every six months, or mm-hmm. they do it annually, they have to go through, especially regulated industries, right? Mm-hmm. They have to go through that um, testing. Are you able to run this in disaster recovery mode and go into this process at any time based on the BCP planning and so forth? 100%. In fact, that is one of our recommendations. We recommend that customers do this every six months. Mm-hmm. You can put it into the DR mode, almost like putting it into an emergency mode and testing it, like mm-hmm. how we do like for fire systems. We recommend customers test this every so often and see the impact of, of it, make sure everything is working fine. You can uh, put it into a DR test mode and, and make sure everything is okay. We recommend that as well, yeah. So can you also talk a little bit about dynamic performance-based selection? Of course, yeah. This is something new that we announced as well as part of uh, our resilience launch that we did uh, about four weeks ago now. Um, this is one of those uh, capabilities that, that will address your brownout scenarios. So what this is saying is, hey, um, the client connector, which is sitting on your, um, on your employee or employer-provided device, is constantly looking for 
two data centers, two locations mm -hmm. to make sure which is my primary, which is my secondary, where do we have a better latency? It's always monitoring two at a time. And if it thinks that one is suddenly much better than the other, it automatically switches mm. over. So this is where we address the performance issues of a brownout scenario. In the past, if you don't have a scenario, let's say you're tied, you're hard coded to go to a particular data center. And if there is an issue with the data center, the traffic still continues to go to that one. And so that's how the performance drops. Now we don't do that. We are automatically on the back end. Not only are we looking at data center A, we're also looking at cloud B and saying, hey, which one is better for me? If B suddenly gets better and if performance is dropping on A, I will say, I'll just switch it to B and so that I keep the optimal performance at any given time, right? So mm -hmm. we build that directly into our system. This is one of, way, one of the things that we do to help customers at risk. So in that, with the dynamic performance selection, mm -hmm. That's based on the client connector that organizations have actually deployed to users' desktops. Exactly. So is there a certain version of client connector that that comes into uh, play? So that this capability will be uh, will become generally available in March, so in a couple of weeks. Okay. When that happens, it will be pushed through all the client connectors, and so um, the client connector that will, that you have will automatically have this capability. Oh, that is awesome! You know how many people out there <laughs> right now listening are like, "Oh, thank God, I don't have to do anything." <laughs> yes, that's yeah. awesome, and so that's going to be just another differentiator to this platform. Exactly. Of having that that automatic. Mm -hmm. Selection. Correct. So the next question I'm going to ask you that a lot of um, the yeah. organizations are thinking about is, you know, they're having to account for audits. Yes. Right. So can you talk a little bit about do we have resilience audits that are going to be part of this mm -hmm. disaster recovery that organizations can run, mm -hmm. that they can monitor, that they can actually provide to potentially yeah. any of the auditors that are coming in? Yeah, yeah. I'll answer this question um, slightly differently in the sense maybe I'll kind of zoom out a little bit and tell you a little bit more about our approach to just building this capability, right? It's, it's a really cool capability that we're built in, but we are not out there monetizing it. We are not out there telling customers, hey, we've built this awesome thing which makes our mm -hmm. cloud even better, buy it from us, pay extra. Instead, what we're doing is it's built right into our product and we want customers to use it. So what we are doing is in addition to building this capability, we are investing significant amount of resources mm -hmm. on our end. Uh, having a technical account management team, a customer success team, everybody reach out to customers actively and saying, guys, this is important. This is something that you guys will have to do. Mm -hmm. And we have built together, built what is called as a Zscaler Resilience Audit Program too. So this is a uh, customer can sit with our technical account team, work together mm -hmm. and build an audit uh, mm -hmm. plan for the customer and, and then use that as your standard operating procedure going forward, which will tell you, hey, we have to do this every six months. We have to check this every so often. And it's literally like a, a mm -hmm. operating guide that you will build with the Zscaler team. And then we you can use that for regular maintenance going forward, right? So so we are uh, we want customers to use this. We have given ourselves an aggressive goal to reach out to all mm -hmm. cust existing customers. Mm -hmm. So they are protected from anything like this. And for anybody new, they will hear about it from, from the get-go. We want customers to, to buy and use Zscaler, enjoy it, and never have to worry about, hey, what happens to my business because everything is going through Zscaler. It's a great tool. How I'm protected. We don't want want customers to ever ever worry about that. That's a major initiative to reach out to all of our customers. That's right. And make sure that they are covered with the resilience. Yeah. Which is phenomenal. All right. Is there any other things that we haven't covered that are yeah. part of this this new capability with the resiliency that we haven't talked about? There's one more um, that I would like to highlight. This mm -hmm. is again uh, um, pertaining to the brownout scenario. Typically what happens is um, um, customers, they tend to create subclouds. We call it subclouds, meaning here's a list of five clouds I want to use mm -hmm. for traffic to go through in my region. Let's say APJ, for example, right? And, and then what happens is um, it, the, the client uh, connector on your device is always trying to find and operate only within those five clouds. But then if uh, the trust portal or the, uh, the monitoring solution tells you that one data center or one region is affected because there is a, a flooding there, a natural disaster, mm -hmm. something happened there, uh, we can now 
uh, manually go say, take this data center out of my subcloud. Do not consider this for an X period of time, let's say for three days. What that does is that now it automatically starts looking at the rest of the, the clouds in mm -hmm. your subcloud and reallocates what should be a primary, what should be a secondary. So this is again, uh, uh, our automatic, automated way of ensuring that there is no loss in productivity just because we didn't, we continued working with the data center, which was poor. Instead, mm -hmm. we take it out and then go address it and, and use some other cloud to kind of route traffic. So we call it uh, um, data center exclusion, customer control data center exclusion capability, where we give them the tools. We, this is a one, one more situation where we give the customer the tools, mm -hmm. they'll have to take use it. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things that we can do on our own, some things we give the customer the tool. This is one of the scenarios where we give the tool to the customer and educate them on how to use it. I think the key piece is the education, exactly. right? To make sure and part of that resilience audit, yeah. making sure that the customer understands how to use the resilience, right. when to use the resilience, mm -hmm. and then can be actually part of their BCP. And they're not being charged a whole nother platform to uh -huh. do this. It's, it's being baked into the actual Zscaler offering, 100%. which is yeah. awesome. Just that in itself is awesome. Exactly. Anybody we have talked to so far, customers have loved this. Um, we've talked to a lot of analysts who have been very, very excited about this, mostly because our approach to this, not mm -hmm. only is this unique capability technologically, but it's the fact that we are putting resources to reach out to customers, one. Two, we have built this directly into the licenses, meaning the customers already have the licenses. They've mm -hmm. already paid for this. We are not asking them to like pay extra or, or upgrade to a different license. 95% mm -hmm. um, of our customers are on this license called the Business Edition. And with that, you pretty much get all these capabilities that we talked about in the last uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. <laughs> so if, if, I'm a, if I'm a customer today and I haven't been yeah. reached out, can I just go ahead and reach out to my account team and they'll get me in contact with the right people? 100%, yeah. Just Go to the web, web page, put in your information, and we'll reach out to you if you're not already reached out. <laughs> awesome. And so one last question. What uh, features, functionalities may be on the horizon that you can talk about? I know uh, this is this is massive in itself. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much needed for these organizations. But anything else? No, I, 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 like you said, yeah, this is this is a, a whole lot already, and, uh, and this differentiates our solution. Uh, compared to anybody else in the market. Um, but we, we our, our exchange continues to grow. We continue to add more capabilities. So we'll be addressing um, workloads connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, IoT connectivity, and then we'll be, we'll be expanding our resilience capabilities to all of those also uh, in the near future. And you'll hear more about this. And stay tuned, come to Zenith Live, and uh, maybe we'll have more surprises. <laughs> that's, that's an awesome plug. Everyone <laughs> should be attending Zenith Live. It'll be phenomenal. It is in the June timeframe in Vegas here in the American that's right and so with that thank you so much congratulations to the team thank you honestly thank you. because it is a phenomenal um, addition to a phenomenal platform already so. i think it is, it is a job well done by the team I, and i want to like pass it on to everybody who's been really close to this and working on it for many months now thank you thanks for having me Pam. take care everybody else and stay tuned to another episode soon to come take care thanks for listening to cloudy with a chance of trust Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find Lisa Lorenzen and Pam Kubiatowski on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com or on LinkedIn. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult with your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2022.